Hello everyone. I am myself Dr. Rajesh Gubba. I am the general medicine educator. So as a part of the 50 days medicine challenge, so I welcome you all to <coughs> medicine challenge day 6. So every day I am posting the quiz on my telegram channel that is medicine made easy by Dr. Rajesh Gubba. So all of you please follow this medicine challenge and try to complete your general medicine thoroughly without having any particular inconvenience in your preparation of general medicine. So starting with the session, the first question is which of the following <coughs> is correct statement about the Graham Steele's murmur? The options are high pitched diastolic decrescendo murmur, second option low pitched diastolic crescendo murmur, third option high pitched systolic crescendo decrescendo murmur, fourth option high pitched systolic late systolic murmur. So the correct answer here is the high pitched diastolic decrescendo murmur. So first of all you need to know that the pulmonary this Graham Steele's murmur is the murmur which is heard in patients with pulmonary hypertension. <clears throat> so these patients with pulmonary hypertension, they develop the functional pulmonary regurgitation. And the blood is moving from a high pressure area that is pulmonary artery <clears throat> into a low pressure area that is right ventricle. So it's like the high pitched murmur and the movement of the blood from the pulmonary artery into the right ventricle, it occurs maximally in the early part of the diastole. So it is the early diastolic murmur and it's a decrescendo murmur. So decrescendo murmur in the sense, so initially the pitch of the murmur will be high and gradually the intensity of the murmur keeps on decreasing. This is what is called decrescendo murmur. <clears throat> the other condition where you can have this decrescendo murmur is the aortic regurgitation. So both of them you have decrescendo murmur. Whereas you take crescendo decrescendo murmur, crescendo decrescendo murmur it is seen in case of aortic stenosis and in case of pulmonary stenosis. And the other condition where you can have is MVP with MR. <coughs> Actually in case of mitral regurgitation, it is like plateau shaped murmur. But in case of MVP with mitral regurgitation, you have the crescendo decrescendo murmur. So the answer is the first option that is high pitched diastolic decrescendo murmur. Next question. So continuous murmur <coughs> is seen in all of the following conditions except patent ductus arteriosus, coronary AV fistula, pulmonary AV fistula, VSD with aortic regurgitation. So continuous murmur in the sense the one which is heard both during systole and as well as the diastole throughout the systole and throughout the diastole. So in the first three conditions you have the continuous murmurs that is PDA, coronary AV fistula and pulmonary AV fistula. And the murmur in case of PDA, like we have a name for that, that is called Gibson's murmur. Whereas in VSD with aortic regurgitation, it is not a continuous murmur. In VSD, it is pan-systolic murmur. <coughs> Whereas in aortic regurgitation, it is the early diastolic murmur. So the one you don't have the continuous murmur is the VSD with aortic regurgitation. Now let me tell you all other conditions where you have the presence of continuous murmurs apart, apart from the first three options that includes. So you also see that in case of the iota pulmonary window, <coughs> coactation of iota, venous hum which is heard in children, then ruptured sinus of valsalva, then followed by that the Pregnancy that is mammary sofal that is over the mammary gland and it's a like a physiological murmur and uh, <clears throat> peripheral pulmonary artery stenosis associated with Williams syndrome. So these are all the conditions where you have the presence of continuous murmurs. Next question. Mid systolic click is classically heard in mitral valve prolapse, Haman Ridge syndrome, rheumatic aortic regurgitation, congenital mitral stenosis. So mid systolic click <clears throat> with late systolic murmur it is a characteristic feature of the mitral valve prolapse and you take this the haman rich syndrome the haman rich syndrome it is like idiopathic interstitial lung disease idiopathic interstitial lung disease is what is nothing but your haman rich syndrome where you don't have the mid systolic click and <clears throat> in case of the rheumatic aortic regurgitation in rheumatic aortic regurgitation you have the presence of the early diastolic murmur, right? And in case of the congenital mitral stenosis, that will be mid diastolic murmur with pre systolic accentuation. <clears throat> so the answer in this question is A, that is mitral valve prolapse, where you will have the presence of mid systolic click. 
and the other condition that is we also call it as the ejection systolic click so the other conditions where you can have this mid systolic or ejection systolic click that will be <coughs> aortic stenosis and then the pulmonary stenosis so these are all the conditions where you have the presence of click next question Reversed split S2 is seen in the aortic stenosis, mitral stenosis, pulmonary artery hypertension, and then pulmonary stenosis. So, <clears throat> reversed split S2, it is seen in case of the aortic stenosis. Actually, the character of the S2 in case of aortic stenosis completely depends upon the CVRT of the aortic stenosis. In case of mild aortic stenosis, you will have a narrow split <coughs> second heart sound. Whereas in case of the moderate aortic stenosis, you will have single S2, right? Where A2 will get merged with the P2. Whereas in severe form of the aortic stenosis, <coughs> you will have reversed split, where you will have P2 first and then followed by that A2. That is in case of severe form of aortic stenosis. So mild aortic stenosis means where the aortic valve area <clears throat> it is in between 1.5 to 2 cm square. Whereas in moderate aortic stenosis, the mitral valve area is like 1 to 1.5 cm square. Whereas in severe aortic stenosis, the mitral valve area is less than <clears throat> 1 cm square. So in case of severe aortic stenosis, you will have reversed split. Whereas in case of the mitral stenosis, you will have the characteristic abnormality as loud S1 and you will have mid diastolic murmur. Whereas in pulmonary hypertension, you will have loud P2. Whereas in pulmonary stenosis, you will have soft P2. And in aortic stenosis, apart from the reversal split, even A2 also, if you see, like you will have soft A2. So that is about like where you will have the reversal split. Next question. <coughs> Which of the <coughs> following is not a high pitched heart sounds, mid systolic click, pericardial shudder, opening snap, then the tumor plop sound. So mid systolic click, pericardial shudder, opening snap, all of these, <coughs> they are high pitched. Whereas you take the tumor plop, which is heard in case of myxoma, that is atrial myxoma. So this will be a low pitched sound, right? And one more important point of difference is <coughs> your Tumor plop, it's a diastolic sound. Opening snap, it's a diastolic sound. Pericardial shudder, it's a diastolic sound. <clears throat> but mid systolic click, it is a systolic sound, right? It is a systolic sound. And you take the mid systolic click. The mid systolic click, you listen that in case of the aortic stenosis, pulmonary stenosis. Pericardial shudder, <clears throat> which is nothing but the pericardial knock. <clears throat> you listen this in case of the constrictive pericarditis. Opening snap seen in or heard in mitral stenosis and tricuspid stenosis. Okay. And <clears throat> the tumor plop sound heard in case of atrial myxoma. So, which is not a high pitched sound is the tumor plop, which is a low pitched sound and it's a diastolic sound. Next question. Loud P2 is found in the pulmonary hypertension, mitral stenosis, mitral regurgitation, the aortic incompetence. So, loud P2. <clears throat> it is heard in case of the pulmonary hypertension. Whereas in mitral stenosis, what is that you will have is loud S1. Whereas in mitral regurgitation, <clears throat> you will have soft S1. Whereas you take in case of the aortic <clears throat> incompetency, <clears throat> aortic incompetency is nothing but aortic regurgitation. In aortic regurgitation, you will have soft A2 or there will be like absent A2. Okay. But the loud P2, it is heard in case of the pulmonary hypertension. Next question. <clears throat> First heart sound is soft in all except the options are short PR interval, VSD, mitral regurgitation, calcified valve. <clears throat> in short PR interval, you will have loud S1. It is not soft S1. Okay, then ventricular septal defect, mitral regurgitation, calcified valve in all these conditions, 
you will have <coughs> soft S1. All right. Next question. So all of the following are the diastolic sounds except third heart sound, fourth heart sound, then opening snap, ejection click. So just now we were discussing that ejection click, it is a systolic sound. Ejection click, which is a systolic sound, right? And it is heard in A2 <coughs> and as well as P2. And it is a high pitched sound. Right, it is a high pitched sound. Whereas you take this opening snap, opening snap, it is heard in the mitral stenosis and tricuspid stenosis. And this opening snap, this is also a high pitched sound. And S3 and S4, right, they are diastolic sounds, but they are low pitched sounds. Because they are low pitched, <coughs> they require bell of the stethoscope to listen. Right. Whereas ejection click, it is not a systolic sound. Right. The question asked is all are diastolic sounds except. Okay. And whereas opening snap is also the diastolic sound, which is heard in the early part of the diastole. Right. Which is heard in the early part of the diastole. Next question. <clears throat> so continuous murmur is found in all except mitral stenosis with mitral regurgitation, patent ductus arteriosus, ruptured sinus of valsalva, systemic AV fistula. So <clears throat> patent ductus arteriosus, ruptured sinus of valsalva, systemic AV fistula. In all these conditions, you have the presence of the continuous murmur. Whereas in MS with MR, you don't have a continuous murmur. In MS, it is like mid diastolic murmur. Whereas in MR, like it is the pan systolic murmur. So continuous murmur is found in all except what? That is mitral stenosis with mitral regurgitation. The answer is A. <clears throat> Next question. So during the cardiac cycle, the opening of the aortic valve takes place at the beginning of the systole, end of the isovolumetric contraction, end of the diastole, end of the diastasis. So opening of the aortic valve, the opening of the aortic valve, <coughs> it occurs at the end of the isovolumetric contraction phase. Okay. So exactly at the during isovolumetric contraction phase, the AV valves, that is your mitral valve and as well as pulmonary valve, they close. Whereas the aortic valve at the end of the isovolumetric contraction, they open. Okay. It is not the beginning of the systole. Actually, isovolumetric contraction is nothing but the systolic phase. So it is not the beginning of the systole. The aortic valve is, will open. Very important point. At the end of the isovolumetric contraction phase, the aortic valve and as well as pulmonary valve, both of them will open. Okay. Next question. <clears throat> so which disorder of the carbohydrate metabolism typically has the cardiac involvement glycogen storage disease type 2 pompase galactosemia glycogen storage disease type 1 von gerks hereditary fructose intolerance so it is your pompase which will cause the cardiac involvement okay now we have <clears throat> what is called as the infantile form of the pompase. So in case of the infantile form of pompase, you have the cardiac involvement and that is in the form of cardiomyopathy. So that cardiomyopathy will be like, okay, so cardiomyopathy in pompase, what all will be the uh, cardiac manifestations, cardiomyopathy and as well as the conduction disorders. And what are the other disorders that can be seen? <clears throat> Muscular hypotonia and as well as the floppy baby. And even the tongue, if you see, these individuals with pompase, they have the macroglossia, right? And another important is there will be also organomegaly in these patients, right? There will be organomegaly in these patients. So, and the cardiomyopathy that you will see in case of pompase will be of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, right? Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy where there is severe thickening of the septum. That is what you will observe in case of the pompase. Now, <clears throat> and this particular pompase, it's a glycogen storage disorder. So glycogen storage involves not only the cardiac myocytes, right? You also have the conduction disorders and this, right? And this particular conduction disorders will be in the form of the 
pathology in the AV node and as well as the His bundle cells. And there can be also the pre-excitation pattern in the form of short PR interval. There can be AV blocks and there can be also the bundle branch abnormalities. So these are all the features of your Pompase. Okay. So it is in Pompase where you have the cardiac involvement. And this particular Pompase is what? It's a glycogen storage disease type 2. Right. Whereas type 1 is Von Gerg's. Whereas type 2, that is Pompase, is where you have the cardiac involvement in the form of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Next question. <clears throat> so cardiomyopathy is not a feature of Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, Frederick's ataxia, Pompase disease, Lowe's syndrome. So in case of the Lowe's syndrome, you don't have the cardiomyopathy. And this particular Lowe's syndrome, it is oculo cerebro renal syndrome right oculo cerebro renal syndrome okay so this is what is called as the low syndrome and this particular low syndrome it is a multi-system disorder right it is a multi-system disorder so what are all the structures which gets affected oculo that is eye and cerebro where you have the involvement of the nervous system renal where you have the involvement of the kidney so this is what is called oculo cerebro renal syndrome that is called low syndrome whereas in duchenne's muscular dystrophy frederick's ataxia in both of them you have the development of dilated cardiomyopathy whereas in pompeis just now we were discussing there can be development of the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy all right next question and one more storage disorder where I mean one more glycogen storage disorder apart from Pompase where you can have the development of your cardiomyopathy is that is Forbes disease. Right that is Forbes disease. So you take in case of the Pompase in case of Pompase what is the enzyme deficiency that can be asked as a question in case of Pompase that is alpha 1,4 glucosidase right 1,4 glucosidase this is the enzyme which is being deficient in pompase whereas in case of phobes that is also a glycogen storage disorder so in case of phobes the enzyme that is by being deficient is amylo 1,6 glucosidase <clears throat> right amylo 1,6 glucosidase so this is what is nothing but your phobes okay so pompase and as well as phobes both are these glycogen disorders which are as glycogen storage disorders which are associated with the development of your cardiomyopathy next question cardiomyopathy does not occur in duchenne's muscular dystrophy alcaptinuria pompase and as well as febreze so the where the place where you don't have the cardiomyopathy is in case of the alcaptinuria whereas duchenne's muscular dystrophy i said you like uh, you have the development of dilated cardiomyopathy whereas in pompase also we have discussed just now there can be development of the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy now coming to febreze so febreze it is the one which is responsible for the development of the restrictive cardiomyopathy so uh, febreze is what exactly it is a lysosomal storage disorder where you have accumulation of the sphingolipidosis right accumulation of sphingolipidosis and in case of febreze right what is the enzymatic deficiency that is alpha galactosidase a right alpha galactosidase a in case of uh, Pompase, what did we discuss? It is alpha 1,4 glucosidase. Whereas in case of Febreze, it is alpha galactosidase A. And one more uh, sphingolipidosis is your Gaucher's disease. So in case of Gaucher's and as well as Febreze, in both of them, you have excessive accumulation of the sphingolipids right and that can result in the formation of the cardiomyopathy so, okay so in case of gauchers like what is the enzyme that is being deficient in gauchers it is beta glucocerebroside right beta glucocerebroside so that is the enzyme deficiency in case of your gauchers and that will result in the sphingolipidosis causing your cardiomyopathy okay but the where you don't have cardiomyopathy is in case of the alcaptinuria next question <clears throat> incorrect statement about the broken heart syndrome catecholamine toxicity st segment elevation apical ballooning dobutamine for cardiogenic dysfunction so the incorrect statement about the broken heart syndrome is that 
the dobutamine for cardiogenic dysfunction we don't use that if at all if there is any cardiogenic dysfunction in case of broken heart syndrome like what we use is intra aortic balloon pump because the cardiogenic dysfunction in patients with broken heart syndrome is mainly because of increase in the catecholamines like epinephrine norepinephrine and as well as dopamine so because the increased catecholamines itself they are causing pathogenesis and causing development of your broken heart syndrome or takotsubo cardiomyopathy so in spite of that like if we give dobutamine the Takotsubo cardiomyopathy, it can get precipitated. So it is like catecholamine toxicity and there will be ST segment elevation. And even the troponin I or the troponins will be elevated. And apical ballooning syndrome or apical ballooning will also be there. Hmm? Apical ballooning will also be there. And the next very, very important point that you need to be very much aware of is the coronary angiogram in these individuals, they are absolutely normal. And the name of the criteria is the modified meos criteria right modified meos criteria so this is what is your broken heart syndrome so name of the criteria is meos criteria st segment elevation will be there troponin will be elevated apical ballooning will be there with hypokinesia in 2d co but coronary angiogram will be absolutely normal and you need to rule out pheochromocytoma and that is called meos criteria all right next question So, banana shaped left ventricle is seen in. So, the shapes of the LV lumen is very important in various cardiac conditions. So, in case of the HOCM, you have the banana shaped left ventricle. And in case of the dilated cardiomyopathy, the shape of the left ventricle, I mean the shape of the ventricle will be, it is like spherical shaped ventricle. Right? Spherical shaped ventricle is seen in case of the dilated cardiomyopathy. All right? And in case of uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, it is like banana shaped left ventricle. And uh, in Takusubo, like what you have is the apical ballooning. Right, you will have the apical ballooning. Next, spade shaped ventricle. So the condition where you have the presence of the spade shaped ventricle that you come across in case of apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, right? that we call it as the ace of spades right apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy you have the spade shaped ventricle okay so this is about the shapes of the ventricle next question which of the following is the treatable cause of restrictive cardiomyopathy febris amyloidosis endomyocardial fibroelastosis hyperusinophilic syndrome so the answer is febreze so febreze like it is mainly because of enzymatic deficiency you need to do the enzyme replacement therapy and febreze will cause uh, restrictive cardiomyopathy and most of the times these patients with restrictive cardiomyopathy they are like untreatable they require only cardiac transplantation but the disease which is like treatable in case of uh, restrictive cardiomyopathy is the febreze and what is the enzyme that you need to replace is so you need to do the enzyme replacement with beta a galactosidase that is what is being used in febris and that is what you need to do in case of febris right and this beta a galactosidase it is manufactured using dna recombinant technology and this particular febris it is an x-linked disorder right it is an x-linked disorder okay and what are the other features of the febris the other features of the febris will be acroparesthesia there will be also like kidney damage and because of the kidney damage the presentation will be in the form of the foamy urine due to proteinuria and as well as the renal failure and cardiac involvement can be there and this cardiac involvement can be in the form of the restrictive cardiomyopathy and even there can be skin involvement and that skin involvement will be in the form of the angiokeratoma right angiokeratoma that will be the skin involvement and what will be the investigation of choice in case of febris so it is like basically enzymatic deficiency so you need to test the alpha galactosidase assay alpha galactosidase assay now because this uh, enzyme is being deficient right so enzyme replacement therapy in the form of beta a galactosidase that is what is being used in case of febris, all right, which is manufactured using the DNA recombinant technology. Whereas in majority of the forms of restrictive cardiomyopathy, they are like untreatable. So they require cardiac transplantation. But whereas febris, it is a treatable cause for restrictive cardiomyopathy. Next question. 
the drug contraindicated in HOCM is verapamil, propranolol, digoxin, none of the above. So the drug which is contraindicated in case of the HOCM is the digoxin. Okay, and what is the drug of choice in patients with the HOCM? That is the beta blocker and the alternative drug will be the verapamil. And there are many drugs which are contraindicated in HOCM. One is your digoxin. The other drugs which are contraindicated is sympathomimetics. Right, sympathomimetics. Then the other drugs will be like diuretics and as well as the nitrates. So these are all the drugs which are contraindicated in patients with the HOCM because all these drugs will increase the obstruction and thereby the cardiac output will be reduced and the clinical scenario will further get precipitated. So that is the reason why you should not give digoxin, sympathomimetics, diuretics and as well as nitrates. Next question. So dichrotic pulse is seen in HOCM, dilated cardiomyopathy, restrictive cardiomyopathy and left ventricular failure. So dichrotic pulse, it is a characteristic feature of the dilated cardiomyopathy. Whereas you take in case of the HOCM. In HOCM, the characteristic pulse will be the pulses bispherians. Right, the characteristic pulse will be the pulses bispherians. Okay, and pulses bispherians, it is also seen in AS with AR and it is also seen in with like pure AR also you can have this the pulses bispherians and dilated cardiomyopathy you have the dichrotic pulse what do you mean by the word dichrotic pulse you have one peak during systole right and the other peak is like in diastole so one peak in systole and the other peak in diastole and that is what is called dichrotic pulse whereas in case of the left ventricular failure the characteristic pulse will be like pulses alternance right pulses alternance that is what you will have in case of left ventricular failure and you have the other characters of the pulse also let me just describe here all of those characters like we have the anachrotic R pulses parvus et tardus. So here in case of severe valvular aortic stenosis, you have anachrotic or pulses parvus et tardus. And whereas the pulses bispherians is seen in case of AR, AS with AR and HOCM. Then followed by that, you have Warthammer pulse or collapsing pulse or Corrigan's pulse seen in case of aortic regurgitation, mitral regurgitation and all your hyperkinetic states like your beriberi and as well as patent ductus arteriosus. Dichrotic pulse just now I was discussing in dilated cardiomyopathy and pulses alternance we were just discussing now that is severe left ventricular failure. Pulses bigeminous is like seen in case of digoxin toxicity causing ventricular bigemini and pulses paradoxes it is a characteristic pulse in patients with a cardiac tamponade and occasionally it can be seen in patients with a constrictive pericarditis as well and even some respiratory conditions you have the pulses paradoxes and these respiratory conditions will be like severe COPD and as well as the status asthmaticus right status asthmaticus okay and the other conditions where you can have a severe form of pulmonary embolism okay next question which cardiomyopathy is caused by the chronic alcoholism so dilated, hypertrophic, atrophic and as well as restrictive. So the chronic alcoholism, the most common form of cardiomyopathy that you will come across is dilated cardiomyopathy. So chronic alcohol causing dilated cardiomyopathy, this is also called as the toxic cardiomyopathy. And there are many other toxins which are associated with the development of dilated cardiomyopathy. And what are those other toxins? The other toxins will be like your cocaine. Next, adriamycin. Next followed by that transtuzumab. Okay, so these are all the toxins which are associated with the development of your the dilated cardiomyopathy. Whereas, right, whereas the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, if you see, it is due to gene mutation. And what is a gene mutation? That is the beta myosin gene mutation. And this beta myosin gene, it is present on the chromosome number 14. And restrictive cardiomyopathy, the most common cause will be amyloidosis. Right, the most common cause will be amyloidosis. Okay, so which cardiomyopathy is caused by chronic alcoholism? That will be your dilated cardiomyopathy. Next question. So all are true about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy except the options are 
systolic dysfunction, concentric hypertrophy, diastolic dysfunction, double apical impulse. So the one what you don't have is the systolic dysfunction will not be there in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So you have the concentric hypertrophy. So for, to first of all, to call it as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the increase in the thickness of the myocardium should be more than 1.5 centimeters. Then only we call it as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And it will be concentric hypertrophy. And because of increase in the thickness, there will be diastolic dysfunction. And these individuals, they will have double apical impulse, not only double apical impulse, even if you take there will be double carotid upstroke, right double carotid upstroke. And the another very, very important point is these patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the characteristic pulse like what has been described is this is called as reverse pulses paradoxes. That is what is observed in case of your hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Next question. Which of the following can differentiate between the cardiac tamponade and tension pneumothorax? Raise, I mean, JVP, which is being raised, pulse volume, breath sounds, and pulse rate. So, JVP, in case of tension pneumothorax, you know, it's a severe form of, or the it's a pulmonary emergency or respiratory emergency. Immediately, you need to take the white bore needle and puncture the pleura in the second intercostal space in case of tension pneumothorax. Otherwise, the patient can have cardiovascular collapse. So, the JVP is elevated in patients with the tension pneumothorax and cardiac tamponade also. And the pulse volume, if you see, in both of them, the pulse volume will be reduced because the cardiac output will be reduced in both of these conditions. And breath sounds, this is the differentiating factor. In case of tension pneumothorax, the breath sounds, they are completely absent. Whereas in case of the cardiac tamponade, the breath sounds are being present. Whereas the pulse rate, if you see, in both of them, there will be tachycardia. And that could be reflex tachycardia also because these patients, they will have severe form of hypotension and the hypotension can cause tachycardia. So the one which will be helpful in differentiating cardiac tamponade from tension pneumothorax will be breath sounds. Okay, next question. Backstriad of cardiac tamponade includes all of the following except hypotension, increased JVP, muffled heart sounds, tachycardia. So what is that you don't see in case of the backstriad? Backstriad it is seen in patients with the cardiac tamponade. You will have hypotension, increased JVP, muffled heart sounds, but you don't have tachycardia in case of the backstriad, right? So it is a very characteristic feature in uh, cardiac tamponade. Okay, next question. And increased JVP, the proper description in case of cardiac tamponade that you need to know is Kusmal sign in case of the cardiac tamponade will be absent. That is one important point. And the next important point regarding the cardiac tamponade uh, JVP is the X wave, it is the exaggerated, right? X wave is exaggerated. But if you take the Y wave, the Y wave, it is absent right y wave is absent okay so that is about the jvp in patients with the cardiac tamponade next question so hypotension with muffled heart sounds and congested neck veins is seen in cardiac tamponade pericardial effusion constrictive pericarditis then acute congestive heart failure see you take this muffled heart sounds it can be heard in cardiac tamponade it can be heard in even in case of pericardial effusion also but the point here is hypotension with congested neck veins right that is seen in patients with the cardiac tamponade because in pericardial effusion uh, you don't have this congested neck veins and you don't have the hypotension as well in case of your pericardial effusion and in constrictive pericarditis you have an additional sound right and that additional sound will be the pericardial knock right pericardial knock and in case of congestive heart failure like you will have bilateral basal fine crepitations that is what are being heard in case of your acute congestive heart failure okay so the answer here is the cardiac tamponade next question So the reason why in case of cardiac tamponade or pericardial effusion, you will have muffled heart sounds is because there is fluid accumulation surrounding the heart. So the conduction of the sound to the surface of the chest will be reduced. So thereby you'll have muffled heart sounds in pericardial effusion and cardiac tamponade. Next question. Incorrect statement about the Dressler syndrome is the post myocardial infarction, pericarditis, pleuritis, autoimmune treatment with steroids is necessary. Okay. So. Uh, Dressler syndrome, it is one of the late complication in case of the MI. So it is a post myocardial infarction pericarditis and it is also post myocardial infarction pericarditis and what it is actually it is characterized by autoimmunity causing the damage to the heart. Right? It is characterized by autoimmunity causing damage to the heart. Okay, And when will this Dressler syndrome develops is it occurs 
after few days to weeks after the development of the myocardial infarction. And what will be the drug of choice in these patients is you need to give high dose aspirin, right? And how much will be the dosage of the aspirin is you need to give 650 milligrams thrice daily is what you need to give in case of Dressler syndrome. And treatment with steroids is necessary is a wrong statement. We don't give steroids in patients with the Dressler syndrome. And how can you diagnose Dressler syndrome is the ESR is being elevated. And along with that, if you take the ECG, ECG will show the ST segment elevation and that too, it will be like concave ST segment elevation. Okay. So the answer here is treatment with steroids is necessary is a wrong statement. Next question. Restrictive and constrictive pericarditis occurs together in radiation, adriamycin, amyloidosis, post-cardiotomy syndrome. So, restrictive cardiomyopathy and constrictive pericarditis occurs together in case of the radiation, right? Whereas adriamycin, it is associated with the dilated cardiomyopathy. Amyloidosis, it is concerned with development of the restrictive cardiomyopathy. But radiation, it can cause both. That is constrictive pericarditis and as well as restrictive cardiomyopathy. So in both of them, the treatment will be like more or less same. Like you need to give diuretics, right? You need to give diuretics. That will be the medical management. And with the diuretics, if the patient symptomatology is not reduced, the individual is refractory to all the um, uh, medical management. In restrictive cardiomyopathy, the option is cardiac transplantation because the most common cause is amyloidosis. Whereas uh, constrictive pericarditis, you need to do pericardial stripping. Right, you need to do pericardial stripping. Okay, so the answer here is the radiation. Next question. Most common presentation of the cardiac lupus is myocarditis, pericarditis, aortic regurgitation, Libman Sachs, endocarditis. So the most common presentation of the cardiac lupus is the pericarditis. So if you take lupus, it is like pancarditis. Okay, so you will have like pericarditis, myocarditis, then endocarditis. Okay, and out of all these, like what will be the most common? The most common will be the pericarditis. Whereas myocarditis, and these patients with the uh, pericarditis, they present with the chest pain. Whereas in case of myocarditis, these patients, they present with the heart failure. Okay, whereas in case of the endocarditis, this is called as Libman Sachs endocarditis, right, which is also called as the verrucous endocarditis right, which is nothing but your verrucous endocarditis, okay. So, Libman, that is what is your Libman Sachs endocarditis. And uh, in case of your lupus, apart from pancarditis, these patients will also have the development of the coronary artery disease as well. So, that is because of vasculitis, okay. So, most common presentation of the cardiac lupus will be in the form of pericarditis, right. Next question. So Beck's triad is seen in, so it's a repeat question like constrictive pericarditis, cardiac tamponade, right ventricular myocardial infarction, restrictive cardiomyopathy. So you see that in patients with the cardiac tamponade and this Beck's triad is what? It's like characterized by raised JVP, muffled heart sounds and as well as the hypotension. Next question. So all of the following statements about chronic constrictive pericarditis are true except, except commonest cause in India is idiopathic, Kussmaul sign is present, ascites, right ventricular end diastolic pressure is raised. So commonest cause in India, it is like not idiopathic, it is like tuberculosis. So that is the except. Kussmaul sign is present. Ascites present. Right ventricular end diastolic pressure is also raised in patients with the chronic constrictive pericarditis. Okay. And uh, this constrictive pericarditis, the Kussmaul sign is present along with the uh, constrictive pericarditis. The other conditions where you can have Kussmaul sign is the restrictive cardiomyopathy. In all the patients, wherever there is right heart failure, you have the presence of the Kussmaul sign. Okay. Next question. A patient with congestive heart failure with left ventricular ejection fraction, 40% should be given. AC inhibitors plus beta blocker, AC inhibitor plus furosemide, AC inhibitor plus calcium channel blockers, AC inhibitors plus ARBs. So what should be given? So it is like heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So what is the drug which we are using now is the ARNI. That is angiotensin receptor blocker plus neprilysin inhibitor. Hmm? Angiotensin receptor blocker plus neprilysin inhibitor. So this angiotensin receptor blocker will be valsartan 
and neprilysin inhibitor will be secubitril right will be secubitril okay now in the scenario where we cannot give arni in that case like in in the scenario where we cannot give means like it is like a little expensive drug if the patient is not affordable for arni then the alternative drug will be ace inhibitor plus beta blocker what is the advantage of this particular arni or the advantage of ace inhibitor plus beta blocker is they are the drugs which will improve the ejection fraction of the individual okay so the answer is the ace inhibitor plus beta blocker is the answer next question right incorrect statement about restrictive cardiomyopathy kusmal sign is present pulsatile liver pedal edema dip dip and spike configuration in the ventricular systolic pressure so kusmal sign is present in the restrictive cardiomyopathy right which is nothing but increase in the jvp during inspiration so normally what should happen to the jvp during inspiration so during inspiration the jvp should fall but if there is increase in the jvp during inspiration then it is nothing but your kusmal sign pulsatile liver will be there and that is because of the development of tricuspid regurgitation in case of restrictive cardiomyopathy pedal edema can be there and that is because of right heart failure in patients with the restrictive cardiomyopathy dip and spike configuration is not seen during the ventricular systolic pressure see your restrictive cardiomyopathy it is a disorder which is characterized by diastolic dysfunction right so you will have dip and spike configuration in during the ventricular diastolic pressure right but not during the ventricular systolic pressures okay so the answer in this question is d so these are the important 30 questions in the medicine challenge 6 right so i'll be next posting the video of the medicine challenge 7 as well so please follow my telegram channel medicine made easy by dr rajesh gubba to complete this medicine challenge in 50 days where all the topics of the general medicine will be covered in this right thank you very much and see you in the